depth like uh, what about the research topic how to choose the research topic how to go for the search uh, and how to go for uh, the analysis uh, critical evaluation analysis and uh, the uh, outcome measures how to compile the outcome measures so many things are to be uh, discussed so for any post graduate who has uh, entered into an institution or for any uh, person clinical person who would like to participate in the uh, uh, academics uh, they would like to go in the academics they need a knowledge of this and uh, they have started the idea of bringing this and every year we are conducting it also and uh, on behalf of the preeti institute of medical sciences and research i welcome uh, the three uh, main speakers dr terence uh, who has been uh, uh, also in madurai uh, whom we have uh, missed but trichy uh, trichy is fortunate to have him as a microvascular and a hand surgeon at the same time he is also the editor of uh, journal of microvascular surgery uh, i welcome you uh, dr uh, uh, terence and uh, for this uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, cme and uh, dr jay vengadesh who is a arthroscopic and uh, sports medicine uh, uh, surgeon uh, he is with us from chennai and he is a freelancer he is known uh, well known in the field of uh, the arthroscopy and also in the research methodology i also welcome uh, dr jay vengadesh and uh, dr somashegar you all will be very uh, very well aware of him that uh, he is a senior arthroplasty surgeon and he has been with the preeti institute of medical sciences and research for past 10 11 years and uh, he is much into it uh, doing all complex revision cases and i welcome uh, dr somashegar for uh, talking special topic on ethics in uh, methodology so and uh, at the same time i also uh, thank uh, uh, dr ashok sham who has uh, more kind of convened this session into the ortho tv uh, thanks dr ashok sham you have built the edifice of uh, the entire edifice of uh, the orthopedics uh, online digital world of orthopedics uh, thank thanks to you uh, definitely all the people will be uh, owing much to you uh, in the future also uh, over to uh, dr prahlad who is our senior most arthroscopic surgeon and uh, he is also the editor of uh, Uh, a section of uh, the art, uh, arthroscopy and sports medicine in ijo and um, i think uh, dr prahlad will be moderating on uh, the various topics and what essential topics are to be covered that has been covered in this uh, cme over to prahlad thank you sir uh, good morning one and all so i uh, ask uh, dr terens to share his screen so uh, research has become an integral part of our education now so without research uh, you cannot uh, uh, stay uh, in our field in the present uh, scenario so this is not new the research has been happening since ages and that is why we are able to uh, see what has happened in those previous years and all so it is uh, very important how uh, we have to uh, Uh, make a record of it and how we have to showcase our work so this is an opportunity also to uh, showcase our work uh, but since uh, it uh, we have to show the entire world what we are doing so we have to follow a uh, common uh, platform so uh, now we have our uh, various uh, uh, faculty and uh, uh, experts who will give us an idea and overview of uh, how we can uh showcase our work uh, to the entire world so i welcome uh, dr terens uh, to give us an overview of various types of studies and its significance over to you dr terens uh, thank you uh, very much uh, dr praglad for your uh, brief introduction um warm welcome and wishes and um, greetings to professor dr chidambaram uh, professor dr sukumar sir and my co panelists dr jay venkatesh dr somashekar <coughs> and the ortho tv uh, who has efficiently organized this event i say it's a prime important for the starters we all know that a master was once a beginner we don't call everybody a master because they have worked out hard put out all their efforts 
and then they become a master. So all those postgraduates and the persons who are interested in research, and this is going to be the first start, and definitely are going to be a master in due course of time. We have all understood the protocols and the way how a scientific study works. In this brief introduction, about 12 minutes and 3 minutes of discussions. And Dr. Pragulad, you can stop me in between if I'm overshooting the time because there are a lot of speakers. And the topic which I chose is almost quite elusive and elaborate. I don't think uh, we'll have sufficient time to discuss, but I'll try to do it uh, for the understanding, the basic understanding for the postgraduates and for the, uh, the starters. <clears throat> I've made this topic with a lot of examples so that we'll try to understand how this works rather than being a, a dictatic uh, lectures. You know, uh, why we need to publish? People say, why we need to publish? And who are the ones who started the publications? To be very clear, 350 years ago, the first founders were the Viscount and the King Charles and Francis Bacon were the one who started the world's first scientific journal. Why do they start the first world? Sir, why do they start the journal? Most of us, they want to know what is the necessity of publication. If Babinski was not there, or Babinski has not reported his publication in way back 1922, we would have not got a sign to differentiate between the upper motor neuron and low motor neuron. So that's the significance and incredible of publication and uh, spreading of scientific knowledge to generations to come. Still now we follow this Babinski reflex. Also, we know that in our yesterday years, surgeons used to operate with bare hands, but nobody's could say that this would cause infection and cause problem unless a publication in BMJ, which found that surgeons don't wash hand, produced 50% of mortality in the case series. This much of significant uh, you know, problem happened post-operatively, changed the entire scenario of wearing gloves once this publication came into existence. Also, we got Nobel Prize because of wonderful publications and fantastic work on um, insulin. You know, in a 14-year-old boy who was about to die because of type 1 diabetes. So Frederick was the one who treated this patient with insulin, cow insulin. Later he found this patient was allergic to cow insulin. That paved the way to modification of using human DNA and combinations of various combinations of insulin. Now a diabetes is being well controlled because of the use of uh, insulin, which was published in Canadian Medical Journal way back in 1923, which led to the Nobel Prize. This much is the value of publication. So as a starter, we should always start our work collecting all the thesis work and putting them into a right track of getting a publication. Start now, because if you don't start now, I know I'm going to start. So these are a few list of articles or list of scientific studies which we come across in our practice. You might have heard of any journal, when you open the journal, there will be classifications of various types of studies. The basic one is the case reports. The other studies are the cohorts of the case control study, the clinical trials, systematic reviews or meta-analysis, and assessment of diagnostic procedures and basic science study. This may look odd for you as a beginner, but this looks very important when you start writing or when you start producing or publishing articles. We'll start with the first one, basic case reports. Most of us know case reports are saying something about an interesting case. Say, for example, if you have a distal radius fracture, you find something new in that. You want to say to the world that this is something new and this is how we treat this patient. So this is the basis of a case report. What is the advantage in the case report? You say something new in the case report. What are you going to say? Sir, I've seen a distal radius fracture with a ola subluxation of a lunar facet causing a carpal translocation or carpal subluxation. Something new you want to say to the world where you need to fix those fragment with a fragment specific plate and the results are good. So case reports definitely have a value in the research, especially in the significance of saying something new. But the limitation is that you're going to say only one report, which may not carry a big message to the entire world, where many other surgeons or many other people would have seen this, uh, you know, interesting or new aspect. Why I'm stressing the value of case reports. So what is there in the case report? Way back, <coughs> uh, Longer time, in 1961, Lancet published a letter to editor, now called as a uh, case report, saying that the thalidomide caused congenital abnormalities in pregnant ladies who were taking this medicine for uh, nausea or some sedative. Unless this case report was not published, we were not ab aware about the problem which happened uh, in the post-delivery post babies. 
So this led to a quick stop of the thalidomide drug, entire drug in the Western countries. And once the letter is published, approximately two to three weeks from the letter, the entire thalidomide was stopped for giving to the pregnant people. This much is the value of a case report. Not to mention, lithium was also used for treatment of psychiatric patients, which was also incidentally reported as a case report. So, we of, I often tell my friends and colleagues that everything changes practices following either a failure or a success following adverse complications. So, this is the value of a case report. And do not worry that this case report uh, might be not new to the, uh, you know, in the entire uh, uh, significance of studies. But then if you have a rare disorder, they have educational value. And if you think that this could change the entire clinical practice like a thalidomide or lithium, it is worth reporting a case report. And the limitations I've mentioned, this may not be practically applicable to other countries. Say, for example, you say, Dyslidis fracture or a rare case of dyslidis fracture associated with the dyslidia ulnar joint seen in Indian women or Indian population, which may not work well in, with, with Western, Western countries. So obviously, are uh, creating a bias. Bias is difference of opinion between population work well. And we, we have seen that the citations for the uh, case reports are very less because of the significant uh, bias and other factors seen in case reports. So almost all practicing physicians, they started their uh, you know, publications probably with the scientific uh, case reports. And they are, it's worthy publishing if we have uh, enough academic value in this. We should follow in any case reports. The criteria for following or criteria for making a better scientific uh, case reports are given by CARE guidelines. This CARE guidelines have 13 checklists. So once you start writing a uh, case report, it's better you have these checklists under your uh, system and then start working based on this. Say, for example, any patient information you want to share, uh, say, for example, I have a, a OLA dislocation of a PIP joint. So you need to clearly mention about the population. A uh, 32-year-old man had a P OLA PIP joint dislocation. How do you diagnose by x-rays? Or if you additionally need a CT scan, what do you intervene and what is the outcome? So this is given in this uh, methodology. As I mentioned, the role of case report in medical literature should be novel, should educate the community, and also should have a rare manifestations. Not that you see a new finding, start uh, writing as a case report. And those are the criteria which definitely all the editors will appreciate if you have something new. So, for example, if you knew that the association between aspirin and Ray syndrome in febrile children is life threatening, this all came from a case report. And certain cases like life threatening are obviously. If there is a best practice way, those case reports are welcome and they definitely are going to be worth writing and reporting. There are certain instances where the change of treatment plan can also be worth reporting in the scenario. Now, case reports, we could get a, a sense of case reports and how to write a case report and what is the significance of case report, especially uh, in the level of uh, you know, various studies. The next level of study is that one, start writing a case report. Once you feel the uh, value of writing a case report, then probably you are in a position to move to the next step, which is called a retrospective study. What is a retrospective study? These are all uh, self-explanatory words. Retrospective is something you go back. For example, I have a case series of uh, malignant fractures, which I have operated using a fragment-specific k wire, and I have a functional outcome. Meaning to say that I have an outcome. So I have a good outcome, a bad outcome. I have a good radiograph, a bad radiograph. What I'm going to do? Going back. Going back. What are going back? I'm going back and see what surgical technique I did and explaining about the surgical technique. Going back, how many patients are there? How many men are how many women? Going back, what is the nature of injury? Going back, what is the presentation pattern? Going back, what is the injury between day and surgery? So, and we, we go back till the date of injury. This is called as a retrospective. We go back. So we have an outcome. We have an outcome, either good or bad. And in going back and studying those variables, it's called retrospective study. So the other example is that so I have a Salter-Harris type 2 fracture in pediatric patients, a amount of cases, 20 cases. So I had done surgery. The results are good. 
or few cases had some complications. So I have the result and going back, analyzing the age group, which age group had a problem, which age group had complications or which sort of surgical technique produced good result. These are all called as a retrospective study. You have outcome, you know the outcome and you're going back. This is called as a retrospective study. I say this may not be that significant in the level of evidence. Why? Because what I'm saying is a 20 patients of Indian population is not equal to 20 patients of population in Western countries. The surgical technique, what I am doing, is completely different from surgical technique done by other surgeons. So there is a lot of bias. And the observation, which I find from the DASH score or the, the uh, patient-related risk examination, PRW score, which I find might be various, might have variation with someone who is there in the Western countries or the European countries. So there are some bias which always has a significant reduction in the uh, you know, overall view of a study, especially retrospective study. So to, to take over this, to get a more evidence-based study, we have a lot more studies which I'm going to discuss. Also, uh, there are a few other patterns of studies. Once you do a retrospective study, you have a call as a middle part, middleman sort of thing where you have you don't have a large number of patients to report, but then you don't have a single case report. It's so called as case series, roughly approximately three to ten or twelve. These patients form a case series. Case series are roughly a bigger variation of bigger variation of case reports. Advantage is that you're going to be descriptive. Again, it's a retrospective study. You're going to be descriptive. You're going to tell that this technique or this surgical technique, uh, which I'm going to describe in a, a illustrative figures, is definitely going to be benefiting the readers or someone who wants to do this technique. Again, the disadvantage is that you're not going to compare this report with the other uh, surgical reports. So for example, there's botany deformity. So I do a uh, flexor digitorum superficial long tendon transfer to get the better deformity. But I'm not comparing this with a primary repair or other surgical techniques such as a pulse, Fowler's tendon uh, reconstruction or other techniques. So I'm not going to compare and say this technique is better or this technique is not better. I'm just going to say descriptive about my surgical technique, which is called as a case series or a descriptive study. Similarly, there are the one step Ahead of this case uh, series is that if you have a control, say for example, I have a distal edis fracture. So does smoking affect the distal edis fracture outcome? So I'm going to do a study. Take 20 patients of fractures who do not smoke, 20 patients of fractures who smoke. So this will definitely have a value of whether the smoking is really influencing the outcome. So this is a way of scientific study which everyone wants. As an editor, you always like to have a comparative study or a control study, which definitely has a scientific evidence, which you have, you can say that this is a worth way of, you know, getting uh, information passed on to the uh, benefit to the readers. But just describing the procedures, you'll have some benefit, but then you say that you compare this report with other surgical report, you are having an upper hand of the scientific evidence saying that smokers have less chance of getting fractures in nitrate. This much is the value of a case control study. The other study is a part of a descriptive study, which also we done during the uh, initial phases of COVID, where we do a cross-sectional study. Cross-sectional study is that I am from India. I take 50 other country surgeons. Different varieties of countries are involved. And we analyze, get the feedback from the COVID initial COVID stages. How are they managing the orthopedic cases? Some say I don't operate. Some say I operate. Some say I operate with PPE. Some say I partially operate and then I stop operating. Some say that even as an orthopedic surgeon, I'm posted in the COVID world. So this is the cross-sectional study which gets a collective idea of what the entire world is doing. What's the benefit? It just gives a pass on some idea or some description. Additionally, they may have some recommendations. So we are given a recommendation that the PPE, when should be worn, when should be doing a, a, you know surgery, and how to avoid fumes inside the theaters. These are the recommendations which prevents, avoids the, the passing of COVID infections intraoperative or again in the postoperative or in the ICUs. These are the advantage of these studies. Again, the, all these studies, case reports, sorry, the case series, retrospective studies, case control, they follow a certain type of guidelines. Guidelines are nothing but a printed material which says that these are the things you should keep in check before submitting or before writing an article. You have to keep abstract, title, introduction, 
how is the study design who are the participants so these are the you know sort of title every journal prefers to have you can go and download this in the given website link and get the articles which is being uh, which are you planning to write based on this abstract and this uh, checklist uh, for writing all those studies now let's move on to the other aspect prospect i say prospective because it is very positive it is something you are going to find it something new from your study you don't have outcome now i'll go with an example here there is a wrist fracture patient whom they wanted to treat with a distal edis plate of one company and a distal edis plate of other company you don't have the outcome you do not say that this company is better than this company but then you are going trying to prove what is better or what it is this plate is better or this plate or they don't have any you know, uh, significant difference between these two plates you need to say something about uh, these plate fixation so this is very interesting because you have a scientific evidence which will be followed for a longer time and then at the end you will have the outcome this is very scientifically acceptable and most of the studies sh should focus on this i always appreciate the readers or the youngsters or the younger generation to start with the case report and probably you can go to retrospective and then a prospective study also think that once you are doing a study say for example i i follow a patient with complex periodontal fracture dislocations so i i'm having a study of proximal rocarpectomy so i do proximal rocarpectomy and I publish it but then you should not publish this report Says, so for example, you you don't need to do a proximal rocarpectomy, but you are going to reconstruct it. Something like you are going to do a prospective study and then finding the outcome, and you should not convert a retrospective study to a prospective study. So these are the technical nuances you should follow in in conducting the study and also in getting the study to a publication or to print. There are other type of surgical techniques which often we see in JBGS or other um, search other in journals where they have a surgical sections. jbgs surgical techniques so these are the technical uh, you know uh, studies where the surgeon or the readers they would like to know the nuances of technical stuff right from the incision it's better you have a video recorded or a clear uh, description of surgical technique positioning anesthesia surgical uh, pre op preparations and then incision all these things carry a value so the study should have all these things rather focusing on the outcome or the other aspect you need to add all those detail about surgical technique few complications and finally the outcome this should be the whole essence of conducting a surgical technique again sir i want to emphasize the need of an equipment say for example i am nowadays we are doing uh, the carpal tunnel uh, diagnosis using ultrasound or diagnosing the post operative union using a high frequency doppler so you need to focus on the doppler instrument more specification about the instrument and the application will definitely carry a value to the researcher rather leaving this topic and going and discussing about the surgical technique and outcome does not have enough essence or does not have enough value or sense of you know describing a study on equipment uh, dr praglad i think i'm just overshooting the time we have a systematic review and uh, clinical trials which are very vital probably if time permits we can take it at the end uh, dr terence you have been doing a very excellent job because it is a very extensive topic i think so uh, you can you have the liberty to uh, overshoot uh thank you very much for your kindness uh, the co the co presenters please pardon me I, i'm trying to overshoot the time uh, we will have a uh, sufficient uh, you know discussion probably in the end i'm sorry for overshooting because this is a very vital topic now as uh, the ladder goes on you have a case report you know that how to present a new thing and you have a retrospective study like you are trying to bring new scientific evidence to the uh, community moreover you cross the retrospective study you have prospective study which is always positive and welcome about the newer uh, nuances of comparison of two studies or anything you want to get the functional outcome discussed in the longer term now comes the systematic review or meta analysis is very tough to perform the work itself is a self explanatory systematic review is that you have a pile of collections of articles say for example you have prospective study or thousands of prospective study you have thousands of retrospective study so ideally i want to know whether a scaphoid fracture union is based on what factors you cannot go and read all thousand articles 
you cannot go and read all thousand prospective articles or thousand retrospective articles of course millions of case reports but then you need to know the entire consensus or currently how what is the understanding going on among the surgeons as far as the scaphoid non union uh, is concerned and what are the risk factors there comes a role for a systemic review you are really going to review all those things retrospective articles surgical techniques equipments prospective studies and trying to get a consensus or a common understanding how or what is the problem to the solution so with this people say that these are colors i don't say they are color it's a mixture of red blue green so obviously there are different aspect of a color say there is a scaphoid fracture union retrospective study says that this type of fixation gives good prospective says that this type of fixation gives good a case report says that only this type of uh, technique produces good so there's a mixture of color there's a mixture of article in the literature you go to pubmed you see this different pattern of colors so what is the message you get from this colors blue is not blue red is not red so you need to separate these colors you need to separate these factors analyze all those things and say this is the colorful value of a result so this much is the value of a uh, uh, you know a systematic release uh, study that's why i said it's a huge problem to conduct quickly we we'll go to the case report, the this uh, article so here we always follow a research question based on pico pico is very important it's very easy to understand or keep it um, you know in your mind p is the population o is the population scaphoid fracture is the population i is the intervention what intervention i fixed it with a graft vasculitis graft or non vasculitis graft see is the comparison who which i am going to compare the vasculitis bone graft and a non vasculitis bone graft and o is the outcome what is the outcome we are going to measure the outcome with the dash score radiological union ct union prw score so these are the things which are going to analyze in the systematic analysis now i have i should always have a question there's always a in a word saying that yen endru ketka vitta you don't have the answer so yen endru ke so always ask why 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 say so question is very essential to have a solution without a question the research methodology is always going to be a flawless i'm always going to stress this keep a question question is nothing but a hypothesis it can be right or wrong so ask why why and how why why so in this uh, paper we asked why or what is the difference between a vasculitis bone graft and a non vasculitis bone graft and what are the factors which says that which gives a good outcome so we we kept a good question for this question i we analyzed lot of studies i was mentioning it's a collection the color is a collection of red blue white and all these things similarly for a systematic study have a lot of co colors in it a retrospective study a prospective study a case report a surgical technique whole lot of things are there in the pubmed you need to select what exactly you want what is the selection you want i want to know the articles of vasculitis bone graft i want to select the articles of non vasculitis bone graft and then analyze these three things this is how a systematic analysis work so i have analyzed what should i do there is other factor is called a systematic statistical analysis probably one of the co panelists is going to talk about those things if not we'll have a separate day of analyzing the articles based on the statistical significance so we, we predicted so on the left you see the prediction of all the aspect which cause failure in a vasculitis bone graft on the right prediction of factors which caused failures in on vasculitis bone graft now you got you separated blue colors on one side red colors are on one side white on one side red so we separate the entire color separate the entire article from the pubmed or google or whatever scopus is separated and finally we had a message we saying that the humpback deformity and the dc caused failures in vasculitis bone graft time from injury to delay surgery is also a predictor of non vasculitis bone graft failure if you come late and you put a non vasculitis bone graft this is not going to work if there is a humpback deformity or a dc a surgeon be aware that you are going to have a failure and you have avn in the mri also aware that whether you do a non vasculitis bone graft or vasculitis bone graft there is a possibility of failure now this is a good message for scientist or a surgeon who wanted to know what happens in a scaphoid union so this is the value of a systematic meta analysis you analyze the entire study and say something new to the reader it should be very concise it should be very uh, precise and new to the readers this is how a systematic meta analysis works once you finish this meta analysis the other step or the last step which i say is the clinical trial 
this entail is a completely uh, new scenario because why i'm saying is this now we have done a case report a retrospective study a prospective study analyzing all those things and giving scientific evidence that is not enough why because in a year approximately we get millions of articles especially uh, in 2.5 years there are millions of articles coming out every 2.5 years new informations are passing out in every 2.5 years so we become confused what to follow what not to follow this always creates a burden on physicians scientific strength if you do you call a scientific strength based on this strength i'm doing this based on this knowledge i'm doing this if you keep on changing every two years they keep on changing the knowledge they become confused there comes a role of a clinical trial clinical trial is very simple i'll tell you with example this is an example which is happening in one of the well known hospital what is this sir i want to study the outcome of a posterior malleolar fracture this is less than 25% displaced by operating or non operating so i want to study i want to say i want to conduct a clinical trial in patients i want to do this so what you need to do this you need to create a question as usual as a hypothesis and you need to do the study so how are you going to do the study you are going to separate a patient with the same quantity of fracture into two group how do you separate say for example uh, x y z e they have all fractures or a b c d e f g h all have posterior malleolar fracture so how are you going to select who is going to be operating who are going to be non operating there comes the role of randomization what is randomization you randomly select those patients and put them into surgery you randomly select these patients and put them into non surgery again if i for example if i am the operating surgeon i know that this patient is a close relative to me and this patient is i don't know him so what might be a problem is i might prefer this patient for a operative i might prefer this patient i don't know so i can just put them in the non conservative so to prevent this we keep a blind study we need to say that there are two types of blind study one surgeon knows okay uh, this patient is going for a non operative this patient is going for operative so we'll follow him what happens at the end double blind is nobody knows i do not know who goes for a non operative i do not know who goes for operative this is the essence of you know critical and very important for getting a good scientific evidence you need to have a double blind so nobody should know who is going to get operated who is going to get non operated then you will have a, a functional outcome at the end which is really worth and it has really a meaning to the science clinical trials as far as we concern we take a lot of time in understanding what is clinical trial clinical trial is nothing but there are two sets of uh, worth one is a preclinical other is a clinical so preclinical all comes when they do all those tests in in vivo with all those animals and then they come to a diagnosis a conclusion that this is working we'll take the covid vaccine because this is also equally good if you take for um, metal pretness loan injections or any injections or any worth in using in orthopedic surgery which is going to be beneficiary so they will try all these things in for in vivo animals and then once they finish the preclinical they come to the human that is called the clinical trial you cannot just right away prescribe a metal prednisone or covid vaccine to a patient there what you need to do there are four important phase of clinical trials one the first trial takes approximately a year to determine the safety of metal prednisone or covid vaccine or whichever vaccine you find two confirms the efficacy and also confirms that this is working in a short term it needs two years three it provides efficacy long term and also it is being used in multiple hospitals in say for example we are testing this in tamil nadu we can use in multiple hospitals and get the outcome and this is very essential four is that they're going to use this to educate after the vaccine being delivered or after the injection being delivered you study you continue to study so the common clinical trials i'll just quickly rush through and finish it off so for example why i'm saying this uh, this very important because see for example this is a trial which is being conducted now surgeons want to know whether you operate for proximal humerus i don't operate for proximal humerus 
you can't say by your your own personal experience or you can't quote your retrospective study or original study what is essence is that you need to do a clinical trial from clinical trial of putting all those patients nobody knows who is going for surgery nobody knows who is going for non operative put them in the trial and follow them sequentially at x rays at sequentially at all those post operative x rays and finally you get the outcome that is what the clinical trial or randomized control study has a value similarly you operate for volar distillated fractures with the volar plate you operate with the distillated fractures with k wire follow them without blindly knowing that because they are randomized randomizingly allotting those patients to trial and finding outcome at the end this is this has a true essence why because what happens is that this draft the distillated fracture in uk they found that there is no difference between a uh, dorsal uh, I mean uh, volar plating for dorsal fracture and the k wire so what happened is it completely changed the way of practice the surgeons are completely moved from putting plates to dorsal cavity similarly there is no difference in operating the proximal humerus fractures at certain age group also change the surgeons to move into more conservative and specifically they operate for certain indications so the problem in this is it takes a lot of time you need to have at least 2 to 4 years to get the final outcome many patients might go out of the study and till date there is only 16% of the entire trial they found any difference between study so like for example distal radius volar plating and cavity of the whole only 16 found that there is no difference or there is difference between these interventions rest of them they found there is no difference in these interventions with this um, uh, brief note i welcome you all and take this opportunity to this uh, uh, greet you to this uh, tamil nadu orthopedic conference is going to be happen in 18 20 march and um, thank you all for your kind attention we'll have a lot of questions and discussions permitting to the time thank you i'm sorry for uh, overshooting the time thank you uh, dr terence so i think so it was a, a really truly an uh, overview of uh, various types of studies uh, and you have made it so simplified so uh, i think so uh, i was just uh, had put a question in the chat box and everyone is so i think so it was so simple so there's no questions uh, for here but i think so uh, uh, the way you have stratified all the various levels of studies and uh, you have shown like uh, uh, how the case report and then uh, you have retrospective studies and then uh, case series studies and then prospective studies systemic meta analysis and then finally clinical trials so uh, this gives the entire hierarchy of the studies and uh, how to uh, select a topic and uh, you have totally given you as a overview so i i think so if there are questions we will take uh, at the end and i'll uh, ask uh, dr jayventesh to share his screen and uh, <clears throat> give us uh, how to do a literature search thanks dr terence yes sir good morning everybody uh, thank you dr sivakumar uh, dr chidambaram and the faculty of uh, hod and uh, sorry uh, hod and faculties of uh, orthopedic and anesthesia department in priti hospital and uh, thanks dr somashekar and uh, thank you dr asok shyam uh, like i am a uh, uh, follower of your uh, monday motivation programs and uh, very technical uh, videos by dr neeraj as well and uh, thank you for joining us today Uh, well, uh, Dr. Praglad, I have made this presentation a bit kind of simple for postgraduates. I was told that DNB and uh, DNB postgraduates of orthopedics and uh, anesthesia will be attending that. So initially, I will be talking about uh, like how to do uh, literature uh, review and what is literature review. Then I will uh, tell about some uh, day-to-day usable uh, digital tools that we can use for clinical research and especially for data st- storing and organizing data. Uh, well so to start with uh, the literature review is a comprehensive uh, study and interpretation of literature pertaining to a particular topic of interest uh, it is kind of link between what is already known and what you want to establish uh, further and it is not just summary it is uh, critically analyzing things to find the better evidence so the importance of review you might say that i am a postgraduate student or uh, like private practitioner i am not a, a researcher and no, i am not in institution but still uh, like if you want to stay updated in your area of interest uh, you have to do literature review at various points so generally we do um, review the literature when you write uh, for uh, 
for any thesis or any journal article or if you want to submit a, a abstract for a conference presentation or if you want to update yourself in uh, some particular topic and if you want to validate your new idea or some new thought process or a new concept then it is uh, uh, we can divide this literature review into five steps first and foremost is a research question and followed by the literature search either online or offline mode uh, then we have to organize the information together and the most important part is you should analyze the uh, results now what uh, dr terrens was telling earlier we should be critical in analyzing the things <clears throat> and finally we should uh, concisely write the uh, discussion part or the review of literature uh, in your thesis so first and foremost the research question um, well the the next talk will be on research question elaborately uh, so if you are a postgraduate uh, student or a resident so you choose topics uh, which are achievable within uh, the time frame of your study and it should be relevant to the area of clinical practice and of course it should be uh, uh, like the guide uh, should be okay with that Uh, and it should be answer, uh, answerable from the literature from this research question we frame uh, the aim of the study or the purpose of the study and we will uh, frame some uh, objectives objective 1 2 3 4 based on the parameters so uh, so this is how the literature review starts for each uh, uh, parameter you will do uh, the research later so literature search Uh, well, uh, we should have our textbooks as some baseline uh, literature search for a comprehensive review. Uh, so from that, you should build up further, and you should search the latest articles. You always refer to scholarly articles and don't take uh, information from uh, these blogs or websites or some newsletters. So you you should prefer uh, the scholarly articles. so preferably of uh, being uh, in medical fraternity we use uh, pubmed and uh, scopus for all other uh, like generally for science web of science and embase it's for uh, various streams of uh, um, science students and yeah, particularly for orthopedic ortho evidence is giving uh, concise uh, uh, details about various articles that are being published Uh, well like we saw earlier that where there are various types of studies and all uh, so we from all those uh, literature we will be concising uh, our uh, the relevant uh, data so when you search uh, in the internet and all you will be finding many uh, articles that may be interesting but you should focus on that are essential to your topic only in coding it is not very uh, complex thing so generally if you want to narrow down your search you use uh, like and and uh, like or if you want to exclude something then you use uh, not uh, in the search bar and if you use double quotations uh, so that you will have two uh, phrases in a phrase search can be done uh, so these are uh, explained very well in pubmed in pubmed tutorials and you should use uh, pubmed mesh terms so these are the keywords that that are used for indexing by these uh, search machines in the in electronic libraries so you even your uh, thesis writing as well a uh, journal publication you should be using this mesh terms so that your articles would be found easily by the search engines so uh, use this keywords for uh, search so there is uh, like if you are starting to search on a particular topic if you found a key article a mother article uh, like it was a landmark article in that but uh, um, uh, pertaining to your topic so for for instance if you have a particular only one article if you have in your hand so from this you can um, find out at least 10 more articles so, so how you can do that so first of all you can uh, obviously your yeah, google title search is there so that that you can do and from the references if you find the references so that few of the references will be particularly focused on the topic of interest and you can uh, uh, chase the authors so that particular author will be like the more likely that he will be publishing more uh, articles in that same uh, domain so uh, you can chase the references or you can chase the authors and of course uh, in the google and pubmed you will know what are all the future articles that have cited this particular article so from that citations you will find uh, articles relevant to the present article so this is called bates model of uh, berry picking so once you uh, like whenever you collect information you arrange them in a chronological order so for that you can use google sheets i will be telling that later um, so you can have uh, uh, kind of filters from when you want to search 
and whenever you do a search in google or pubmed so you log in you have an account so that uh, you, every time you go that uh, the, your searches will be saved in the saved in those uh, your personal accounts in google and pubmed so that you can see later so data collection is uh, it's not very difficult of course if you spend time and if you are focused in with keywords and uh, uh, maybe the kind of author search or citation search you will find easily but later you will have pile up of uh, downloaded uh, pdf uh, pdfs and uh, downloaded articles but the next step is most most important organizing the information so this has to be organized in a chronological order and uh, here you have to um, divide the headings then who are all the authors what is the study methodology they used so if you organize the collected information and if you take notes then and there and if you uh, write it in a separate pdf for uh, excel sheet or uh, google sheets format it will be a ready recorder so that every time you do not uh, read the entire article again uh, well of course you can underline the uh, pdfs and you can uh, take printouts and underline it so critical appraisal is uh, like once the data is with you and you have uh, everything jotted out separately then you should uh, like analyze the strength and limitations of each study and uh, you should critically analyze the information particular pertaining to your uh, research question so if you compile everything in a single place it will be easy for you to um, like read and analyze uh, further uh, if when you are writing up you should uh, always uh, mention or uh, like quote the articles which you have read fully you should write the full you should read the full text before putting it in your article or in your thesis don't just read the abstract and uh, mention them well the the write up part or discussion part is it should be focused around your research question you need not start with the history of the the study which you are uh, uh, talking about uh, well while organizing the article should be organized in a chronological manner for you, for you to easily understand but when you write up you should write uh, concisely based on the concepts and you preferably quote latest publications uh, and not the older ones <clears throat> and uh, uh, you remember the uh, uh, evidence uh, ladder from case reports to the uh, randomized control studies and systematic reviews so you give pre importance to those uh, um, the higher level of evidence while uh, writing up and you to avoid plagiarism you uh, use the references appropriately <clears throat> so so from that so let's move on to the uh, commonly uh, like easily usable free digital tools it's not that are not available but we may not be using it regularly uh, so to basically to start with uh, like if you have your some deadlines or timelines for uh, through which you have to complete these things uh, maybe for if it is months later uh, you can use this uh, schedule send in the gmail you can send it send an email to yourself or uh, to your uh, co-authors or your teammates so that at that particular point of time you may not remember that but you will find a mail in the inbox saying that so this is your deadline so this is a simple uh, hack that you can do in your day to day basis uh, even for other things in life you can use this schedule send of uh, a gmail and see the google has uh, google sheets google docs and google slides even this presentation i'm making through google slides uh, so these are uh, like uh, of course many of you might be knowing but for those who don't know uh, this is these are uh, microsoft alternatives to microsoft word and excel and powerpoint uh, so these uh, the advantage of this is like uh, you can collaborate with your co-authors and you will have previous versions stored uh, online so that you will never miss your data so you can collaborate with co-authors you have mobile apps so whenever you want you can read and revise and you, you can share the link with your guides so that in you, uh, it cannot be it need not be personal uh, personal meeting you can they can uh, remotely give comments and they can uh, edit the content so simultaneously multiple people can edit this so article writing rather than in ms word you can preferably do in google docs and in a similar way the google sheets is the alternative to excel sheet so like here if you see there are comment section uh, so in that uh, like once you coherently arrange the uh, journals one by one uh, so then uh, it is easy for you to read later and while writing discussion part it will be easy for you rather than uh, searching pile of uh, downloaded paper printed papers <clears throat> so here if you see uh, in the right hand side i have uh, this chrome extensions 
so google scholar extension zotero extension skyhub and some dictionary and grammarly these extensions come handy uh, while writing this uh, uh, manuscripts <clears throat> there is one other thing called google alerts in google scholar uh, so if you find some particular article uh, like relevant to your topic uh, you can um, uh, like uh, find the author and you can have alert for that particular author so whenever that author publishes a new uh, article or you can have keyword uh, alerts for your topic so that whenever uh, a new publication comes in that uh, area you will be alerted so that you will stay updated until you complete your thesis writing or publication whatever uh, so this is an another uh, useful free tool available by google and as i told earlier we have to log in to the google or pubmed so that our data will be stored uh, history search history will be stored but here there is something called google uh, library my library in google scholar uh, so for instance uh, if you find some article good so you can save it then and there so that will automatically get saved into your uh, my library so that you can uh, find that in your my library when you come later in my library you can create multiple folders or if you do multiple two, four five researches simultaneously you can have folders for each and you can store your data um, in various folders of course the same work will be done by referencing managers as well but this is uh, like whenever you search you can directly save it uh, in google as well or you, if you uh, feel uh, if you only one place you want to have is referencing manager like mendley or zotero then that's equally fine <coughs> so this is uh, the whatsapp group uh, like only neeraj dr neeraj has told this uh, in one of the ortho tv webinars like you can have you can create a whatsapp group with yourself and one of your friend and then later you can delete him so that it will be a solo group for yourself so whatever relevant uh, topics or uh, images or some pdfs which you find relevant to your topic uh, you will you can uh, send to that group so that will be your thesis group or some thesis article group uh, so it will be easy for you to do google sorry this chat search at a later date um, <clears throat> this kind of organizing uh, photos and uh, documents in one place for thesis uh, for later uh, referencing <clears throat> and grammarly like we see a lot of uh, ads in youtube and other things grammarly is a free tool uh, for if you want to use it for a spelling check it is a free tool if you want to use for plagiarism check and advanced level you have to pay some 10000 per year uh, well for at least for uh, grammar and spelling check it works excellently uh, so you, everybody should have this for your google uh, sorry google docs or uh, this chrome extension is available even for uh, separately for word also uh, it comes add ons are there well uh, for full text uh, we may not, those who are not in uh, institutions which uh, and those who, who do, uh, does not have uh, access to the publications uh, so skyhub has uh, this chrome extension so with uh, this urls or uh, um, uh, dois you can or even with links url links you can search uh, similarly for as uh, skyhub there is libgen libgen is for uh, pdfs springer uh, textbooks or uh, um, olden textbooks are available uh, and full text pdfs are available or if you have access to uh, university library that's well and good or you can ask you one of your friends abroad to uh, give you the full text article well this is another one called uh, the mind map or mind node um, so when you gather information together and if you want to uh, like assemble them uh, it is this one um, it is this mind note is like uh, arranging your uh, thought process in a single page so you can branch it out to multiple uh, headings and in that multiple headings you can branch it out further so if you want to add anything you can add at any point of time and if you want to mix both the, the previous two branches together it is possible uh, so like for any presentation so this one is for related to some municipal repair uh, for a presentation i uh, initially made some side headings and from there i made the so subheadings and so on and so forth so hence uh, like it it makes you in uh, like as you think you can make uh, uh, your uh, thought process into uh, digital format uh, so this will be helpful for you uh, in your thesis writing as well i believe uh, so whenever you find uh, article, things relevant to you you can make this um, 
my mac because if you write in a google uh, like in a document form uh, it is it is difficult for you to insert later uh, insert at a later stage uh, it will look it look a bit uh, like clumsy but here it will be a bit separated and uh, it, visually it is um, better for you you can use my node in uh, this is for uh, uh, mac and for windows there are mind map and free map uh, there are multiple things are available and the most important thing every student must have is a referencing manager it can be either mendeley or endnote or uh, personally i use zotero for uh, several years uh, it's very uh, helpful for me it can be added as an extension so if you find any article or any uh, anything which you search in internet you can save it to your folder you, you will find multiple folders so in that uh, you can create multiple folders and whichever folder is opened in your zotero when you when you save it it will got autumn it will get automatically saved into the open folder so it can be opened in the zotero folder folder as well also in online also you can find it so the, the beauty of zotero is you need not uh, for referencing you need not write the name of the author a title and uh, the year of publication by yourself it will automatically extract metadata from your uh, uh, content and it will be easy for you uh, while writing your thesis whenever you add an uh, additional reference you need not change the reference number zotero will automatically change your references so this is how zotero will look in word so, so these are the important tools which i think will be useful for uh, postgraduate students while they start the embark their journey in uh, uh, thesis writing so to conclude uh, review of literature is an important part uh, for clinical practice as well as the research uh, we should focus uh, to get information from the scholarly articles and there is a five step process starting from uh, defining the research question and gathering information from the internet or in from the textbooks you can use boolean operators and citation managers to use google to uh, save the articles so organize the data uh, using this like spreadsheets or mind notes and summarize and critically analyze all the articles and also begin write up so in the next presentation i will be talking about how generally we write journals from the heading uh, till the uh, conclusion in each subheading what what is expected from by, by the editors and reviewers so this is uh, all for this uh, literature review topic thank you very much uh, thank you uh, dr jayankaresh i think so it was uh, so uh, let's you talk uh, so i was just uh, imagining about uh, the researchers around uh, uh, three decades ago where these all digital things were not there only the library was there and uh, they used to how they used to access all these information and uh, they have done the research is a really a, a thing to ponder because now we, uh, you have uh, shown uh, so many gadgets so many tools uh which uh, by sitting in one place we can uh, do all these uh, things so uh, thank you for uh, this great information uh, how to do a literature search and how to use the pubmed and various tools uh i think so we can take the questions at the end uh, and we'll move to uh, you can unshare the and uh, I, i request dr terens to come up with his next talk how to to select the research topic Terence, sir, you are there. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prasad. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Jayvank. This was also a fantastic talk. Um, sir, I'm, I'm audible, sir. Yes, yes, Dr. Terence. Thank you very much. Um, this um, probably this uh, will be an overlap of a topic uh, from the subsequent speaker. Uh, I'll touch on the uh, few salient point of how to select a research topic, and then um, the uh, Dr. Terence Tesh will probably take over uh, how to you know write a manuscript and uh, including the title and other. Uh, aspects in the most challenging in uh, uh, research is choosing an interesting topic why i am saying interesting is because practically all those um, editors or all those reviewers uh, who see as a research article title um, they would really get impressed by the way you select a topic 
uh, there's always a uh, wording in um, tamil probably sir uh, for um, everybody knows that oru pana sothukku oru soru padam meaning to say that in the entire uh, you know you bake a rice and then you taste one rice and you can come to a conclusion this rice is cooked well uncooked or partially cooked meaning to say the topic itself will say that how efficiently this article is written or how diligently the surgeon has uh, put his time in choosing the such topic or a study and uh, efficacy is also determined by the topic which you choose so this is what uh, a good topic choosing uh, applies to um, before uh, writing any manuscripts the title should always be very clear and uh, it should attract the readers always avoid all those um, jokey titles and inclusions or allusions allusions is nothing but a figure of speech that makes a reference to people plays or literary work indirectly implying them meaning to say that all those catchy words such as um, the first case report of uh, so and so dislocations or um, the um, first report from such such uh, institutions as we have seen a lot of uh, topic or title uh, with the name of the country or name of the institutions or name of the uh, authors in fact we also seen um, signs from uh, authors name so for so called clinical sign because since they have invented they want to put all those names so title is a setting which gives you an idea how uh, you are focusing your entire study you need to narrow down the scope of a title say for example you need to find um, the outcome of distal radius fractures in patients more than 85 years old because there are a lot of surgeons a lot of articles there to measure the outcomes of fractures in distal radius right from pediatric to old age what is what you need is that you need to be very specific and very particular i am narrowing down the outcome to patients who are more than 85 years old why because there you can analyze the outcome of those patients and say that whether these patients need a surgery or don't need a surgery so to conclude the title should be narrowed to and specific to what you want to convey to the readers to do that you also should do the background reading as mentioned by the previous speaker various modalities of searching literature also discussed beautifully in the previous talk i always prefer to ask questions the important thing is that you should never stop asking questions then the answer comes the topic should have why who what where when why are we choosing this topic why are we choosing this topic of distal radius fractures in 85 years old lady or 80 years old patients what are the interest you want to show you want to say that these injured, these patients do not need surgery these patients can be managed conservatively with a close reduction this is the idea of your topic so you should have a choose a topic and focus on why you want this topic whom you want to inform who are the information seekers orthopedic surgeons are the information seekers hand surgeons are the information seekers and of course the trauma surgeons are also the information seekers so you need to, you need to decide whom you are going to sell this manuscript what is the major question in that major question you keep as a hypothesis which has mentioned in the previous or in the next uh, talk does this conservative management in distal radius fractures more than 85 years old is equal or as good as operative fixation this is a question so based on this question your topic should be or your research should go to find a topic the topic should be based on this hypothesis or this question which you want to write which you want to show in an article and of course where you want to publish or where you want to uh, you know send uh, also decides the uh, topic research you want to send it to national or international level and based on that you need to refine it you cannot say uh, the study to analyze the outcome of distal radius fractures in more than 80 years old in south indian population obviously are going to be very narrow 
and uh, the sort of getting publications in an international journal is very remote because they don't want to know what's happening in south india just for a reference i'm mentioning about the research topic and when is also very important so for example um, there's a situation which we had faced uh, and we are also facing is a covid so you want to mention about the covid affecting the orthopedic surgery we also sh shared the previous uh, during our previous talk about how we did an analysis of uh, orthopedic surgery during the early and the mid lockdown phase if you start writing this article now people will not look back into you because we have crossed the covid state and we have started operating all patients with uh, proper guidelines and proper evidence based method but now what you want to, what you want to say probably you can choose a topic of the aftermath of covid or the evidence or the management of orthopedic surgeries in late covid cases or in a complications of covid cases that's where you stand to choose a research topic now we can't write uh, early phase outcomes of uh, uh, early phase uh, necessity for uh, you know, operating orthopedic cases in covid we have crossed those levels so choosing a topic aptly and based on the situation or based on the condition is also very important to find a topic uh as i mentioned choose the special area space be very specific have a time limit for the study and also uh, limit your study to a popular particular population and provide a scientific value do a proper background check up which was mentioned also in the last uh, speaker and also have a, a statistical guide uh, with completing this manuscript i think uh, i'll stop with this uh, um and uh, we'll pass on to the next speaker and we'll take a lot of questions based on this because choosing a research topic is very vital and essential and uh, we'll have a lot of questions and discussions thank you very much thank you dr prahat yeah. thanks uh, dr terence so i'll ask uh, dr venkatesh to share his screen so he is uh, going to talk us uh, about how to write a manuscript so So, uh, what I uh, am able to get uh, from these talks is this is not only for the postgraduates uh, to write their thesis and all. It is for every surgeon, for every uh, physician to uh, uh, do uh, showcase their manuscript, showcase their work uh, by uh, doing this kind of uh, writing a manuscript and uh, publish their uh, work. so i think so it's uh, equally important for an uh, consultant for a practicing surgeon to showcase their work so over to you dr jayanti yes sir so so the, this topic is about uh, how to write a manus manuscript for a journal publication of course the concepts will be same for writing a thesis as well uh, so when do you write manuscript for a thesis or a journal or a conference abstract or for uh, any research grant proposal or for any uh, invited book chapters uh, so it has evolved over time and we write no longer write in uh, papers and pens so so we do uh, manuscript writing in uh, on um, in the document form so if you have the data in hand uh, be it a prospective or a retrospective study so you have a clear timeline preferably you, you should finish within 2 uh, to 3 months because if you keep on dragging um, the the concept and the focus will not be there and you will forget what you have uh, thought earlier so better uh, and also split work among authors and start writing early so if you see a publication so these are the headings you will be seeing from title to background uh, uh, and uh, objectives metals and methods that i am already format uh, so i will be covering each and every uh, topic of this and finally uh, once you submit so what are all the things which you have to uh, do and what are the common mistakes uh, that are uh, done by the author no vice authors so the title of the study as was told by uh, dr terens it can it, it's the most important part of any publication so there are uh, uh, many articles get screened based on the title and then followed by the abstracts and then by the tables and figures so uh, this this should not be they should not go wrong uh, so title should be clear concise and short preferably and we can write in three ways so either you can describe the study like here they have described what they did prospective multi center randomized control trial about uh, prp in elbow tennis elbow or you can ask a question 
like whether this prp works in tennis elbow the other way is banging telling the conclusion of your study like this works well so this is uh, giving so so and so results so you can either describe the study methodology or you can ask a question or you just tell your result either positive or negative so generally uh, like next to the title you will see the name of the authors in the in a mean any particular uh, manuscript or something after title you will be seeing the name of the authors so uh, like not everybody involved in the articles need to be authors uh, usually six authors are allowed uh, for uh, original articles case reports vary from four to six uh, so the uh, international committee for medical journal editors describe who is an author and if those they are not fulfilling the criteria of author they should be acknowledged at the end like statisticians or some uh, some mentors so they should be acknowledged and the affiliation should be mentioned and if there is any source of funding like any grants from icmr or dbt tst grants from central government you should be mentioning that and of course if the preliminary pr primary author gets any grant from the industry it should be uh, declared so uh, i recommend all the publisher uh, all the authors to register themselves in orcid so you will be given a number orcid number so during publication if you uh, give this number there won't be any like discrepancy in your affiliation or spelling mistake with your name or uh, those kind of simple things can be avoided and orcid uh, keeps a database of all your publications together uh, similarly google also have this google scholar my profile so that that also you can update your uh, all the uh, articles so that you will know what is your hatch index and that uh, uh, kind of your uh, citations in a single place so like abstract usually uh, journals recommend uh, 250 words or 300 words it should be like a, a trailer for a movie it should be clear and concise uh, most of the journals expect it to be in a structured form like uh, introduction materials uh, discussion kind of thing and you you are not expected to write any abbreviations unless it is necessary like oh, it's well known abbreviations and do not write any reference numbers in the abstract do not write uh, like add tables or figures in the abstract and you need not write all the data from the results only relevant data should be mentioned in the abstract so most of the even reviewers get to know the abstract first before whether to accept to review that paper or uh, not so abstract is uh, next best uh, uh, mirror for you to like uh, it shows about your uh, article next to the title okay so then comes the keywords so keywords is essentially for the electronic search engines so preferably you use mesh terms you search mesh in this pubmed and uh, keywords need, need, need not be the same in the title so if you are allowed to give five to five keywords you avoid those uh, keywords already in the title so that uh, you, the visibility of your paper increases and um, so next to the keywords like generally like we should write start from the introduction or the background so background around 500 words is common for most of the uh, articles journals so we can write two or three paragraphs starting with the why did you start thinking about this study like the what is the problem and what are all the current solution and what is the re recent developments or recent updates but what is new or what is missing in the existing literature so that should be mentioned so that means that because of this uh, deficit in the existing literature you are doing this current study and so at the end of the background you state your hypothesis and so in the background part you can quote latest articles and but but preferably don't use some old references Uh, so that the uh, viewers will know that you are up to date in this uh, particular topic so uh, again abstract sorry the background part should not contain any type tabular column or any figures uh, in uh, in general so so when you come to the aim of the study it should include the primary research question and key outcome variable and also preferably include the describe the study subjects as well so when you are doing a study of comparing this dhs and pf1 for uh, it fractures of hip as in writing it plain you can write as comparing dhs with pf1 in terms of the study parameters like operate, uh, operative time or blood transfusion requirement and hospital stay and uh, also like you can be bit more specific in the fracture like unstable trochanteric fractures so make sure you are focused and uh, uh, not uh, in a broader sense 
So then the materials and methods part, this is the kind of heart of the study. So we are only based on this, you are deriving the results and telling your conclusion. So materials generally, uh, like you can take uh, 1000 to 1500 words. It should be divided into, to start with, you should write the, how did you select the, um, of course, the study design and how do you select the um, subjects deciding on the, uh, based on the inclusion and exclusion criteria, then the sample size and how did you arrive at the sample size and the power analysis. And uh, if it is a prospective study uh, or, or even retrospective and the ethical committee approval uh, will be required and you should mention a word about that. And followed by that, you should write elaborately about what all the study design, like what all the things which you do did to the patient, uh, leading to the uh, outcomes which you are expecting. And finally, in the last paragraph of the materials and methods, you should write the, the statistical part. So relevant to your uh, outcome parameters, you should write. And this R software is a free software available. Uh, SSPS only has free uh, free trial, uh, but later it uh, you have to get paid version. Our software is free. So after this, uh, while writing the results section, you in the first paragraph you mention the key, uh, describe the key findings rather than just writing the uh, results. You describe the uh, findings and use tables and illustrations, uh, well with proper footnotes or legends. For easy understanding, don't repeat the entire thing that you have uh, data that you have written in the tables again in the text format in the results. Only relevant things should be uh, mentioned in the text and do not fear about negative results. Um, so this is like while writing um, in the Word document, you have many tools that you can use. For instance, uh, to start with the spelling and grammar check is a basic spelling check available in uh, MS Word, like in Google Docs that has inbuilt grammar check. If you want Grammarly, you can add it. But for MS Word, there is uh, grammar check is available and you always put line numbers in your journals, in your publication uh, manuscript that you're submitting for publication. So you can interact with the uh, reviewers based on the line numbers rather than telling second sentence in the third paragraph. If uh, most uh, journals expect you to send with uh, proper line numbers. So while writing itself, you have line numbers in your um, manuscript and also stick to the word count. There are word counts. If you select the paragraph, then it would show what are how many words in that. You should stick to that. And you have add-ons like uh, Zotero and Grammarly uh, to check, uh, to add, uh, insert references into the manuscript which you're writing. And of course, there are comment section and uh, so that you can interact with multiple people in the it's both for word document or for google docs and there is something called track changes so that this helps to know what are all the changes which you have done in the manuscript recently when compared to the previous uh, version of the manuscript well so this is for the the, the, the previous uh, uh, discussion is about how writing the manuscript in general particularly for the discussion part uh, the discussion can be from 1000 words to 1500 words so in the discussion, to start with, you describe the study, aim of the study and the key, key outcome which you have found out and discuss about the results one by one, comparing with the existing literature, what are all the similarities and what are all the differences. So at the end of the discussion, there should be a paragraph for limitations. Some journals expect it to be numbered one, two, three or some they don't like, but you have to write uh, the limitations of your study. So this is the part which reviewers will like to see whether you acknowledge your own limitations of the study. So otherwise that questions will come to you in the after review, you have to answer them. And in the discussion part, you should use uh, references uh, freely to support all your discussions. And don't hide if there are any latest articles that is uh, in contrast with your uh, observation. Um, you should not hesitate to quote that as well. But you should tell why you are, your results are different from the other authors. And always the conclusion should be derived from your study. So there are a lot of authors who said to write conclusion part from the uh, what is already known in the literature without uh, in the context of their own study and study results. So that should not be the case. Uh, it should be based on the your objectives of the study and your results and um, mostly like you are expected to 
like you author generally give a recommendations for future research based on your study like you further large scale prospective randomized studies should confirm these uh, observations so such kind of stuff so once so these are the main uh, uh, headings in any manuscript so following which acknowledgement for Uh, like persons who are involved in the study not fulfilling authorship criteria also if you got any grant or something you can mention this here and it is uh, like generally not used for uh, uh, like acknowledgement uh, in the thesis generally in the first uh, first few pages you will write you will thank all from god starting from god till your wife or husband you will do but not not for the journals so well references uh, or you should stick to the journal requirement for referencing so whatever the journal requirement is you first uh, while starting to write itself in zotero or mendeley you change your citation style uh, referencing style in that so that every uh, referencing you add will be um, written in the uh, finally it will be added in the required format for instance here you can see there are various formats uh, generally indian journal of orthopedics uh, like they follow vancouver uh, styling style of referencing uh, is vancouver can be superscript as well so usually for case reports less number of references less than 10 and for original research uh, some 30 to 40 references uh, are generally uh, quoted and for review articles it can go high uh, and uh, mainly for systematic reviews and the numbers will be more um, and see once you have revised uh, once you have written the manuscript so you have done a phenomenal uh, work uh, that's good but still it's only um initial part you have to mul- revise multiple times and you have to discuss with your uh, guides and other uh, colleagues uh, so before submitting so that part is crucial yeah, you obviously with the poor uh, grammatical uh, uh, sense uh, the reviewers will not be happy to um, like correct your grammar mistakes while they are reviewing so you it's, it's your part uh, to send manuscripts without any uh, minor errors preferably use simple sentences avoid long complex uh, sentences difficult to understand things and um, so common uh, <coughs> common uh, commonly used uh, uh, techniques are like writing in font 12 new times roman uh, font uh, double spacing and having uh, side headings so that in the word document or in the google docs and the side headings will be given separately in the left so that you can go uh, whenever you want to go to the other section and you stick to the word count in each section well uh, there are multiple plagiarism checkers available uh, when you are submitting uh, original research it is advisable to <coughs> check in any of these things grammarly have basic uh, gram plagiarism check but uh, this arcon uh, uni check uh, so these are um, higher level of uh, like plagiarism check they are accurate they will tell how much percentage of your uh, article so are um, uh, having this kind of plagiarism uh, issue Uh, whether you did kind of uh, directly copied from the text uh, generally journals accept uh, somewhere between 10 to 15% of uh, plagiarism uh, this is previously when uh, in mgr university they had 20% of plagiarism acceptable um, they now i think the arkund uh, uh, um, software is been given for all mgr university students for a plagiarism check well there are free versions available uh, to a basic extent yeah you can um, get uh, id from um, some of the your stu- friends who have uh, access to this plagiarism checkers for your uh, uh, articles when submitting the manuscript you should uh, well you you should find what all the um, journals that have sub- that had previously published similar articles like yours for that uh, elsewhere has this journal finder and uh, springer has journal suggester so you can put your topic and abstract so they will suggest these are all the articles that uh, Uh, had previously published and there are high chance of accepting yours as well so based on that you can go and obviously you should check for this article processing charges uh, before submitting uh, so when uh, many of the international journals have this uh, um, like concession for uh, uh, like uh, low income countries based on who criteria so india will have this this uh, kind of uh, uh, concession in this article processing charges you look into that so once you find a suitable journal you will uh, you have to write a cover letter see once you were journal your your uh, manuscript is rejected by a journal uh, so you should time spend time to change 
uh, the from cover letter to the manuscript till the referencing uh, you should change according to the new journal mostly authors are uh, are a bit lazy changing these uh, minor things uh, and ended up in getting rejections again and again so you should spend time uh, to read the uh, journal's uh, requirement based on that you have to uh, edit your uh, manuscript again and again so the, the recently elsewhere springer they come up with uh, uh, like transfer of your articles once it gets rejected to other journals they automatically transfer to other journals so that uh, your work is bit less so while uploading uh, you have to stick to the size of the table or jpeg format or pdf format the format should be uh, correct and the size should not be um, more or less and the images should be clear and uh, so once you have submitted uh, you you will know uh, the timelines which on which the editorial board operates so once the you will get review there are three possibilities either it will get accepted accepted generally after minor or major revisions or it will get rejected so once you are being asked to do changes to to address the queries of the reviewers and editors you should be meticulous in writing the this part is more important than writing the manuscript because you should satisfy the reviewers and the editors and you should answer the queries and you should be modest in your replies you should not be very authoritative and uh, there should not be an argument tone and uh, at the same time you should not leave your stand uh, like you should uh, stand for your uh, data and your uh, observations so in that you should stick to the timelines generally journals give 6 weeks to 3 months for uh, um, Uh, giving your revisions and the next version so you can write uh, what so this is a format by sivo rr for one of my article like i used to follow this for later uh, journals as well even if they don't have this format i myself uh, create a document and uh, write so reviewers comment should be on one side what are all the reviewer is uh, like asking so what are all the response by the author uh, it is like direct communication to the reviewers uh, queries and in the last uh, tabular column the text changes whatever has been made in the initial manuscript uh, subsequently before submitting for a revision so with the line number so that the reviewer and the editor will find it very easy uh, when they uh, see the second draft after revision um, so if, rather than just writing uh, i have changed uh, this text uh, i have changed this uh, figure if you mention this line number is changed uh, from previous early it was this sentence currently the sentence is changed to this way so it is easy for the editors and reviewers to um, like track whatever changes you have done so i i review uh, like articles of few of these journals uh, so i Mm, common mistakes as i told the grammatical mistakes are uh, uh, like common mainly from non english speaking countries like our country and even chinese uh, journal authors and uh, um, other uh, south east asian journal authors um some uh, are very uh, tactical and they use this english uh, um, like article editing services so that they improve their english and send others uh, they don't and they end up in uh, getting uh, rejection it's not only the see grammar is usually not the only thing for rejection but still it is annoying for the reviewer and the editors so you should focus on the grammar things spelling mistakes should not be there so better don't use case case again and again because once i was uh, uh, sent by a reviewer that don't use dehumanizing terms like uh, case so you should write as patient so better we also follow that for international journals so uh, if you write uh, letters from 1 to 10 you better write it uh, in word format o n e 1 2 3 so after to 11 or something 11 patients it's okay for initially 1 to 10 preferably write uh, expand and write in words and uh, do not start a letter with a sentence with a digit and generally uh, don't use present tense in methods and results so it, you have done the research earlier so it should be mentioned in past tense and there should not be any uh, this contractions like uh, apostrophe don't is and didn't so that, that should not be there and acronyms should be expanded in the first time like if you are writing mri a magnetic resonance imaging the, that kind of stuff should be run in first part whenever it appears first in the manuscript that has to be expanded while in the later uh, later uh, areas you can write the short forms and the tables are preferably uh, most journals expect it to be in uh, jpeg format and not in the word document and don't repeat uh, data again from the tables in the manuscript and in the thesis generally what people like uh, they they publish their thesis uh, in journals 
unless the journal is specifically meant for thesis publishing most journals will expect thesis to be altered to the journal requirement uh, so in that generally like uh, the students will write a single paragraph and a uh, full paragraph and the end last sentence they will write the reference um it is not so like you should uh, uh, have in a single paragraph you should discuss multiple facts and uh, um, you cannot write uh, only one reference for a paragraph for the entire paragraph um, better you like uh, discuss from various articles and you can quote various uh, journals <coughs> well there are um, so this 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 is all from writing the manuscript to submission and to how to answer the reviewer's query this is what dr terence have mentioned earlier and there is something called equator network they have this uh, um, checklist for various types of studies from randomized studies to the um, like uh, for case reports they have guidelines and they that are mentioned here so before submitting to the manuscript submitting your manuscript you follow this checklist and the manuscript guidelines uh, so the initial screening will be uh, over there are other tools like uh, enagma academy they have an, uh, they have multiple checklists you know, for uh, sub before submission and i think most of the students will be knowing this uh, government of india has this uh, naptel uh, courses there is free course on biomedical research now the mg university makes it and many other universities like ramachandra and savita also made it compulsory for the students uh, to complete this uh, module uh, before appearing for the exams so uh, to conclude um, like introduction uh, of a manuscript is like why did you start the studies what made you what what is the thought process for you to start this particular study uh, and what is the lacuna in the literature and what you want to find out uh, and then the methods is like what did you do to find out your results and uh, to reach uh, answers to your questions and the results are what what is what are your observations and the discussion is what does it mean so you have found out so much so and so so what does it mean to the reader and whether the reader can implement your research to their clinical practice so this is that is what the discussion part and conclusion is what so what is your recommendation to the ordinary reader uh, so so this covers uh, the basic manuscript writing and what all the contents to be added in each section of a manuscript thank you very much uh, thank you uh, dr jay ventesh i think so uh, uh, you have very uh, beautifully uh, told us uh, how to write a manuscript and uh, what all efforts to be put in that there are few questions uh, one is uh, from uh, in fact there is a suggestion from uh, dr gulapriya she is a professor of anatomy at aims nagpur and madam has suggested that uh, you should not do frequent plagiarism uh, check because sometimes uh, you have to do it only at one time so that uh, uh, your own thing will become again uh, uh, copy so you, you should avoid doing a frequent uh, plagiarism and one more uh, suggestion madam gave i just uh, want to yeah read it out uh, that do not go for a free checkers so uh, is there any uh, suggestion dr jay venkatesh like uh, what uh, is the authenticated plagiarism uh, option sir uh, like as i told turn it in i authenticate and the sarkund are uh, like uh, really good uh, so the most of the mgr university students will be having that finally the students will be given username and login by the university itself so you can send your article to them uh, or uh, you can get the username and password and check yourself or recently like for one or two articles of myself i have sent to this one uh, korean journal cios clinics in orthopedic surgery so because uh, most uh, as far as i know indian journals they do plagiarism checks only at the end after screening process before publishing uh, they do maybe dr terence can explain but there are journals they do uh, plagiarism check initially itself as soon as you publish uh, as soon as you send or submit the manuscript you will get a plagiarism report from the journal itself they will say this percentage is uh, like uh, plagiarism is there uh, so you should reduce the plagiarism and resend so this has become easy for me like uh, like kind of submitting and as well as checking plagiarism from them so you can go for this arkund or turn it what in what is your take on the returns um thanks thanks dr prakat yeah uh, see um, as far as the plagiarism is concerned uh, we the editors are uh, very particular and very uh, stringent on those plagiarism um the moment you submit article to the uh, editorial manager 
as uh, Dr. Jay Venkatesh mentioned, we have a table uh, about the article. This uh, table about the article which includes I authenticate, uh, which uh, screens, uh, which just check the plagiarism before uh, you were coming to the editor. Before we see the article on the desk, we see how much a percentage of uh, plagiarism is seen in this article using I authenticate. So all those editorial managers have a column, first I authenticate and uh, within the bracket they give how much percentage. Uh, as far as the, um, the comments or critics by Professor Dr. Gogupriya, I know her very well. I'm afraid I don't know about those uh, pre-checkers, but practically we advise um, the writers or manuscript uh, you know, authors uh, to shell out some money to buy a genuine uh, worth uh, premium or worth uh, softwares which are really uh, helpful in the long run. Because we know we, we, we are spent a lot of money in other things, but especially in those uh, articles, writing and also references and also in grammarly check something that you need to you know, invest on something to get a, a good outcome. Uh, for submitting manuscripts. Thanks, uh, Dr. Terence. There is one more question from uh, Dr. Saudagar uh, Rengaswamy. Uh, uh, please enlighten how to interpret confidence interval with hazard ratio. I think so. It's a statistical question. Uh, any any <laughs> idea? Uh, if uh, Dr. Jayavangtesh is not going to take I'll just take, uh, uh, I'll just comment on a few of the things. Yeah. Which, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please proceed. See, the conference interval, uh, let me have a few minutes about explaining. So, for example, we are speakers here. Uh, so, uh, I will have a 70, you have 65, 80. So the speakers of this session has a hot mean rate of uh, 70. Yes. The speakers today have a mean rate of 70. What is the probability or the confidence that this uh, equates to a population? What is the probability, what is the confidence, what is the but a guarantee that this equates to a population in Madurai? What we do a statistical calculation is that by putting this, uh, uh, you know, value of ourselves compared to the population in Madurai, what we can assume is that how much population of there in Madurai will have 120 heartbeat? Is it a reality? It's not a reality. So what exactly the reality is, how much population in Madurai can have a heart rate of more than 100? That is the reality. Obviously, you'll have a number. So that will be a number which gives a confidence that 95 this number of patients will have heart rate more than 70. This is a confidence interval rate. A 95% confidence interval is, is something like that 95% of up, if you do in a hundred times, you get 95% of time this value. Right. Will you get a single value or not? That might be a variation of value. Why I'm saying variation of value is that the patient who had in Madurai more than uh, 100, say for example, you have more than 100 uh, uh, heart rate in Madurai, we have 10 patients. You do the test every time, there might be a variation. There might be one or two variation. We need to say that you can have a variation from keep a zero as a variation, nil variation, and minus one and plus one as a variation. The heart rate can go from 101, can go from 101 to 102. There are minor variations which happen in those 10 patients. What are we trying to find is that we give a value such that 95 times you find these 10 patients have more than 100 heart rate. But during that 95 times you check, there might be some variations. That is what is called as 95% confidence interval. It can be a plus or minus 0.1 bit or 2 bit or 3 bit. That's why we give a value of 10 patients in Madurai has a value of more than 100 bit. Plus or minus 2 bits. They can have a 1 or 2 
or they can have a 1 not 4 something like this is the variation we see in a study so equating this to the, his question probably he is mentioning about what is called as a relative risk hazardous risk are quite assumed as a relative risk he might be focusing on some tumor let us assume that he is uh, mentioning about a colon carcinoma so for example you assume a normal patients uh, in particular group what are the assumption what are the con- what is the you know uh, 95 times what what is the probability that these patients might develop a colon carcinoma in future Mm. this is what probably you might be asking you call as a relative risk or a hazardous risk so this relative risk also needs to understand how many what are the patients you have a normal control patient say for example he is going to do a study on 100 patients in that whether he is going to divide this 100 patients into two groups a control group who might not have cancer colon cancer or the other patients who might have probability a possibility of developing colon cancer based on the risk what risk we may not know he has to come out probably a smoking diet um, additional uh, involvement of genes which are predisposed to colon cancer so if we have a what is the ratio ratio is something like you have a tumor predisposing value divided by normal population gives a value value that's the ratio what is the ratio in 100 100 is we have 100 here you have the bottom a top value there that gives a ratio so probably he is mentioning about the relative risk or possibility of contracting this patient going to developing a, um, you know colon carcinoma in the future this is an assumption based on his question probably if we have a chat we can understand so confidence interval is something like 95 times you are sure that this patient will have a carcinoma or will not have a carcinoma that is the final outcome which you assume from by doing this test to conduct a study comparative population mean always population mean is a normal population because you cannot assume population will have a cancer you have 20 cancer patient you compute this to a population and then you find a confidence interval obviously you cannot have zero zero is not a value in confidence interval so there cannot be a patients who does not have a cancer carcinoma they will be having carcinoma what is the value it can be either from minus 1 or to plus 1 i think there are a lot of examples which can explain the question is um, uh, i hope i have answered this question confidence interval to be very 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 simple 95 times there's a probability that this patient will have carcinoma that's what i want just to convey to the uh, doctor thank you thank you thank you so much thanks yeah thank you so much sir dr sodagar i think so you got uh, huh? yes sir i got i got i got thank you thank you so much sir yes sir, i'm doing study on cancer thank you Yeah, I presume because being a gastroenterologist, I presume uh, yours is probably something related to a relative risk or relative uh, hazardous ratio, something relative risk. You have a normal population here, and you have involved population in your study. You want to analyze the ratio, and you're sure that 98 percent this patient with this predisposing factor will have carcinoma. You're just going to say the confidence. Thank you for being on gastric cancer. Thank you, thank you. Yes, which is for the study. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> i think so uh, we will move on with the uh, next talk having uh, uh, seen how to do a review search and how to write a manuscript so we'll uh, i'll invite dr somashekar to give some uh, idea about ethics ethics in uh, research welcome somashekar dr somashekar thank you sir at the outset i'd like to thank uh, dr charan uh, terens and uh, dr jay venkatesh who's a good friend of mine for being guest lectures in today's uh, Uh, CME and also I'd like to thank uh, our uh, HOD Dr. Chidambaram and Dr. Uh, Shiv Kumar sir. Uh, ethics in research uh, is the last topic of the session uh, and I'd like to uh, say what is really ethics and uh, to make it more interesting I'll add on some of the examples to it as well. What is ethics? It's just a moral code of conduct for an activity. are simply said it's right or wrong of an action and bioethics literally says that it is what is right or wrong of a medical research this is the earliest code of research that has been published by charaka uh, what he says is that uh, if a doctor should pledge himself to the relief of patient he should not abandon the patient or should not take any sexual advantage or shouldn't treat a woman without husband and or a relative 
then came the hippocratic oath uh, which we are all uh, following these days it involves first to do no harm maintain confidentiality it should act in the best interest of patient and no abortion or euthanasia should be uh, conducted by the doctor you can divide research into three areas one is pre world war world war and post world war in the pre world war era it was through research that edward jenner was able to discover a smallpox vaccine and uh, much of our knowledge about physiology was given by claude bernard any of you in the physiology department will know uh, his contributions because he was the one who wrote ethical maximus uh, some of his research methodologies were uh, a bit ba barbaric for example to prove that uh, lung is an organ of uh, respiration he slit open the thro throat of a dog pump air into it to say that uh, yes lungs are the organ of uh, respiration earlier it was thought that uh, stomach is an organ of respiration and uh, we all know walter reed for his contribution in the field of uh, yellow fever he was the first person to introduce informed consent and uh, this is the original uh, consent that uh, he has uh, published and uh, it is uh, it says that i so and so uh, i am aware of uh, endangering endur endangering my life Uh, in kind in this uh, trial in the process if i get sick i'll get uh, 100 gold coins if uh, there is a death then my kith and kin will get around 250 gold coins this was the first uh, written consent form published <laughs> then coming to the world war era we all know that uh, uh, nazi scientists or doctors conducted lot of uh, experiments on uh, uh, prisoners of war jews and romanian gypsies uh, whom they thought uh, they are not worthy of leaving uh, this one such uh, trials were conducted at uh, dakau camp where they injected portable sea water uh, put the patients in hypothermia and they conducted high altitude experiments uh, they wanted to see how german soldiers were, will fare in these uh, conditions uh, and uh, the literature has been published with only nazi uh, commitments commits or uh, research that has been done in fact japanese also did certain war experiments um, it was called unit 731 and they did this experiments on uh, chinese as well as russian prisoners of war they did certain barbaric things like uh, dismemberment vivisection and as well as uh, uh, biological warfare research as well <clears throat> we all know dr joseph mengle who conducted twin studies in oskowitz his patients were twins and uh, what uh, he did was he sutured the two twins to see the effects of uh, conjoined uh, twins and uh, used uh, one child as a case and the other one as a control and he injected a drug or a virus into one of the child and at the end of the study he killed both the children Uh, and uh, look examine the organs to find out what are the effects of it uh, ironically joseph mengle was never tried then after world war 2 came the international military tribunals uh, uh, which conducted trials at nuremberg uh, somewhere in 1946 in which uh, almost 20 german doctors were uh, uh, tried 16 were convicted and 7 were sentenced to death and they were charged of crimes uh, against uh, humanity and for performing medical experiments on uh, concentration camp inmates without their consent and if you look at the picture of these doctors listening to the trials they were very much remorseless this committee after the uh, trials developed nuremberg code it is the first internationally recognized code of research and it became an ethical yardstick for to conduct permissible medical experiments these are the Uh, main points of uh, nuremberg code that there should be a voluntary consent benefit should outweigh the risks and the ability of the subject should term to terminate the participation during the course of the trial you may say that i may not participate and you can terminate it willfully only qualified person should conduct the experiment and your research should not result in death or disability to add on to it world medical association uh, uh, declaration of helsinki was uh, Uh, published somewhere in 1964 and uh, this was the one who claimed that consent should be in writing and you should limit the number of uh, use of placebos and also participants should benefit from the research 
this was not followed in uh, jewish chronic research hospital study in this uh, participants were not informed that they were being injected with live cancer cells and the consent was deceptive and in inadequate and it was written in english however most of these inmates were speaking uh, yiddish that is the language of uh, jews then we all know the uh, famous tuski experiment the infamous uh, syphilis study which started somewhere in 1932 and ended infamously in 1972 uh, it was almost for 40 years uh, 400 men with syphilis and 200 without were uh, enlisted in the study and they were either not being told that they are they are having syphilis or not having syphilis uh, and uh, they were clinically examined regularly and uh, those patients who were having syphilis went on to infect their wives and uh, many children were born with congenital syphilis and also the irony is that by 1945 penicillin became an accepted treatment for syphilis which they were not given so it was after the publication in new york times the study has to be stopped and uh, in fact in 1997 clinton gave a public apology to all the victims and if you look at them most of them are sitting in the wheelchair because they were suffering from tertiary syphilis then came the belmont report uh, it involved it uh, involves three basic principles one is respect for a human uh, persons means individual autonomy should be respected there should be maximum benefit and there should be justice means equitable distribution of uh, research costs and benefits later they added non maleficence what is that you should avoid prevent and minimize harm to the others and the research subject should not be subject to unnecessary risks of harm and you should use as minimal number of subjects as possible so that to avoid uh, harm to the patients and at the same time you should get statistically valid data who came with siam's guidelines it added uh, uh, to the existing uh, research guidelines what is that is that if you if there is an ethical approval obtained in a developed country for a clinical trial and if you are trying if you are doing a study in a developed developing country then you have to get a approval from the ethical review board of that country as well just because you have uh, got an approval in a european country you cannot conduct an experiment in india as well this is about the indian scenario indian council of medical research is the nodal authority you can register your uh, uh, research in this uh, website and then you will get an id and then you continuously submit all your reports and uh, at the same time you can get a conclusion certificate as well much of these guidelines uh, are available online it's a uh, 5 cmr guidelines for general research is somewhere on 2 200 pages available free and then they came, came up with uh, new ethical guidelines uh, involving children as well as stem cell research and what are those principles are these are the principles i'll go in brief and uh, with an example how this was not properly maintained during the study risk benefit uh, assessment should be done properly uh, this was not followed in thalidomide study which uh, like uh, dr charan so uh, told that it was used uh, as a wonder drug for uh, morning sickness but in the mainly around 10000 children in 46 countries were born with these deformities so invariably it has to be withdrawn then informed consent informed consent pertaining to your study alone should be taken because you have taken consent for one study you cannot conduct a parallel study with the same consent it was henry k beecher who published uh, uh, who a special article by showing that 22 medical uh, studies were published uh, without the approval of the knowledge like you have taken a consent for a bronchoscopy but they were doing catheterization they were studying uh, bladder catheterization in, in uh, newborn to study ref vesicoureteric reflex uh, but at the same time they were exposing them to many uh, x rays leading to radiation but that was not informed and then comes the vulnerable population or groups uh, who are they as the, they are children women tribal and uh, uh, migrants or homeless or mentally ill patients and who are cognitively impaired means who cannot make take the decision properly so in these patients uh, you should take an additional consent their benefit should be of paramount importance and iec discussion should be conducted regularly in terms of monitoring reporting and it should be published with responsibility 
privacy and confidentiality of the patient is of utmost importance and if there are any serious adverse events you should mention it immediately this was not uh, uh, maintained in havasupian indian tribe case uh, where the blood was taken to study about the susceptibility or the incidence of diabetes in the patients of uh, red indians however the same blood was used to study the genetic susceptibility of uh, schizophrenia in those population so when this was uh, published uh, the learned people of uh, those tribe they came to arizona state in a state to call the blood samples and vowed not to uh, cooperate with them in future then there should be dis- distributive justice like you are doing in a uh, re- you are doing research in a third world country or a developed country developing country uh, then that uh, the benefit of it should be transferred to the, those people as well uh, it's it was not followed it was cutler who was his study was funded by nhs and he did uh, gutamala syphilis experiments and the ris- participants were not even allowed to take decisions uh, regarding the treatment as well in this uh, course of uh, the study almost that resulted in 83 deaths equitable uh, distributive justice is something like this and you should pay for the participation and you should compensate for your uh, if there is any research related harm uh, it was not followed in uh, uh, in the case of henriet and bax uh, th- this is a african american lady who went to john hopkins university with ca cervix and uh, they took the cells uh, from her ca cervix and for the first time uh, they were able to grow cancer cells in the laboratory so this became a very revolutionary idea and then they themselves they themselves called it had hela cell line and uh, john hopkins Re- university research, re- received a lot of fundings in millions uh, however rebecca scoot found out that uh, the kith and kin of uh, henrietta lacks were living in poverty so so the hopkins university has to pay a com- had to pay a compensation for uh, kith and kin as well and then ancillary care or standard treatment should be free like you are doing some study and the patient had some untoward efforts or effects or some problem then you should treat that as freely without any charge there should never be a conflict of interest between you or the person who is going to fund this and uh, this uh, there is an example for this is sinwa shor an article was published uh, in which uh, they published the data saying that uh, Sinwa Shore is very much useful in diagnosing uh, periprosthetic joint infection and it with a, with a sensitivity around 80 to 90%. But unfortunately the paper was completely the study was completely funded by the same Zimmer Biomet group but who were who were the one who were making this kits as well. So those conflict of interest should be mentioned however even if you are doing it you should mention it in your study as well. if it's being funded by someone else and this is the standard guidelines for researcher researchers you should submit an application for iis review and then you should conduct the research get an approval before uh, conducting it then uh, safety reporting should be done and then a follow up has to be published and then information should also be passed on to the research past- participants thank you <coughs> Uh, thank you dr somashekar i think so it was a very uh, uh, updated uh, about uh, ethics so you started all the way from the history prehistorical era to uh, the present uh, thing and uh, the most important is uh, how do they uh, obtain uh, an ethical approval see uh, not all the institutes have an iec no so uh, the how how can they get the ethical approval for the study sir uh, usually in every city now uh, it has been made compulsory that all medicals have uh, uh, an ethical committee uh, previously the number of uh, committees were very less now the guidelines have come means refined in such a manner that uh, almost all medicals should have an uh, ethical committee and all post graduates should submit their uh, uh, ethical uh, committee to their to their respective ethical committee 
if you don't have an ethical committee in your institute what you can do is there are other institutes in your city or something and you can uh, uh, submit it to them you should go and give your presentation and they, then they can give a iec approval uh, nbe says that uh, mm, scientific research committee is the precursor for iec so src can be constituted in the institute itself like preeti hospital has uh, dnb students src can be constituted by the preeti itself with which in also man uh, hod as a chairman and then sabhi other subordinates as well if there are uh, there are many independent bodies as well who can do it especially this uh, uh, independent bodies will do it uh, uh, so that they can give approval for any drug trials or something like that so fortunately you can uh, submit it to those uh, ethical committees but however if you are doing it in a ethical committee submission it should be in the same geographical area like you are conducting a study somewhere in madurai or tamil nadu you can, you probably should not go get an approval somewhere in bombay or north india or in abroad as well that's what cms guidelines says means where you, locally you are conducting that study that geographical area committee approval is a necessary for that as well and they will give you a number and that number can be published uh, along with your uh, publication as well because most of the uh, um, uh, journals these days are asking for ethical committee approval number as well thanks uma and uh, this question is open to all the faculty uh, like what studies uh, do we need to take uh, uh, ethical approval uh, suppose if you are doing a retrospective study or an observational study uh, do we need to take uh, approval for all these kind of study or for uh, prospective study and clinical trials we need to take approvals ethical approval first uh, somesh taker can take then uh, others can also answer this sir all post graduates uh, now whenever uh, they are doing the study they have to take the approval iec approval is a mandatory now these days uh even okay they in, it involves either retrospective or prospective whatever it is they are supposed to get a ethical committee approval and uh, coming to freelancing or general researchers definitely you should get if you want to get it published especially clinical trials and all iec approval is mandatory without that you cannot uh, even start your publication or sorry trials as well whereas certain journals international journals definitely before hand before itself they will ask that uh, there is an ethical committee approval in those uh, scenarios you can uh, uh, you should get it however if you are publishing a small case uh, study case uh, report or something and you are trying to publish in a small uh, uh, journal or something regional journal probably it may not be of that much importance however if you are doing a very clear cut research which is going to give a, a clear guidelines and outcome then iec approval is a must that's what my take is that what about uh, terence and uh, dr jay venkate sir so you rightly mentioned about uh, the iec approval for all uh, studies i think uh, uh, i can't argue more with that all studies in india i think it should need a iec approval there's no doubt about, doubt about it as far as the journal is concerned we the editors uh, we are very particular uh, in getting the approval especially in all uh, uh, prospective and clinical trials Uh, we don't stress too much on the retrospective st- studies and the case reports because an outcome has been achieved for example you have done a surgery or done the outcome um, so outcome has much achieved and you're going to uh, get back to this retrospectively or going to explain about the case reports uh, we don't specifically uh, emphasize on the uh, ethical committee for case reports and the retrospective studies yes for all other clinical studies and clinical trials and prospective studies we do uh, focus especially on those clinical trials and you need the ethical clearance of a committee and especially if i going to do a, a you know a clinical audit and other things as mentioned you also need to have an ethical approval um there is also an art I mean, a journal called bmj british medical journal which exclusively works on um, the uh, ethical committee uh, aspect and principles uh, you can also update get update uh, as and when and uh, there are any changes in the uh, practice of clinical trials and other approvals yes i think so i think so uh, there are a lot of uh, yeah 
yes yes jay vitesh no sir the both the, both the presenters have told clearly uh, like for any kind of narrative review articles uh, the uh, obviously it's not necessary and if you're doing any study from the images based on pax uh, some retrospective study based on that it's not necessary for other all other clinical trials uh, it is uh, required sir i i i think so uh, dr gugapriya madam and uh, lot of uh, chat box uh, is coming and uh, we are very happy that uh, it has been uh, such an interactive uh, session and uh, i iec approval is mandatory for all the uh, studies we do and uh, even uh, madam has told that it has to be approached within 40 km of your place study place of study so i think so uh, we have answered uh, questions from uh, uh, most of the question chat box so dr shukmar sir if he is there sir yeah plus that's really nice very interactive and uh, very useful to all uh, i think your body were moderated very well and uh, thanks to dr terence and dr venkatesh and also the uh, audience Uh, along with soma who gave a different perspective of uh, the ethics thank you excellent so kumar good morning so kumar excellent excellent topic good morning sir paraman 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 <laughs> thank you thank you paraman thank you romba nalla irundhu romba super ah irundhu sandosha sandosha physician research research topics excellent thank you thank you paramar paramar dr uh, paramar is my classmate and thank you so much sir so much sir uh, 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 thank you sir thank you sir right thank you so uh, i think so we had a very great session uh, yes. any final comments uh, uh, anybody wants anything to be told uh, dr T- friends uh, thank you very much uh, for your excellent uh, talk dr jay venkatesh they were really uh, very uh, uh, good talks and uh, very informative and uh, somashekar has given a very uh, uh, good perspective of uh, ethics uh, so i think so this is just a beginning uh, to just uh, stimulate everyone of us to uh, uh take up this uh, venture of uh, doing more uh, publishing more uh, articles so i think so every institute uh, should uh, get their post graduates to uh, uh, start doing this uh, research from the day one so i think so uh, uh, when i have been to uh, several uh, international scholarships and all i was seeing uh, that uh, the kind of education system they have only when you have uh, several articles uh, published in a very standard journal then you are considered for the post graduation or uh, for the uh, uh, your medical graduation so i think so that kind of education system is also been taken in a, in our uh, uh, system where now we have made compulsory that uh, they have made compulsory that you should have so many publications uh, to get any uh, promotions and all so i think so uh, we should not uh, go for uh, uh, there is a lot of paid this thing and also try to uh, follow uh, proper ethics try to do your own study and uh, it is not a difficult thing but i think so we can do it so i thank uh, everyone uh, for uh, participating uh, in uh, this and i i request uh, dr sudeep to give a final comments out of thanks sudeep you are there Yes, sir. I'm there. I'm there. Now, good afternoon to everyone. I think uh, we wholeheartedly thank uh, the, all the faculties, Dr. J. Terence, Dr. J. Venkatesh, and Dr. Swoma, who gave a beautiful and uh, detailed description of how to write and how to select and write a manuscript, and taking and taking us into the digital world. How to use the digital world. I think for all the post graduates, one thing to be remembered is we are in an era. where you need to either publish or perish you know to constantly upgrade your surgical skills so uh, we also would like to thank dr ashok sham sir who gave us opportunity to go live on ortho tv so that every post graduates in and around the corner of institutes of all over india have benefited this talks i would like to also thank dr gugupriya madam who has tra- made efforts to answer all the chat box questions 
so thank you once again to all the delegates who have participated actively thank you all thank you thank you uh, terence anything where dr jayvinte thank you very much sir excellent thank session excellent thank you very much thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you more, sir for this opportunity because yeah i think so it is the, the this program was uh, possible only because of uh, professor uh, who repeatedly told us that we should do this research program and uh, he he is the man behind this program thank you very much sir thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Recording stopped. Speed up or on.